Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Hi, and welcome to the Space Policy Show. I'm your host, Rebecca Rose. As always, you can find us on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show, and you can engage with our experts on Vimeo using the chat. We'd also like it if you would sign up for our latest news and alerts at aerospace.org slash policy. Today's episode is on partnerships across the national labs and academia. This week, we have a special panel of academic experts discussing fostering partnerships between FFRDCs, national labs, and universities. Leading the discussion is Dr. David Miller, Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at the Aerospace Corporation, where he provides leadership to our innovation labs. Prior to joining Aerospace, he was at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The Honorable Deva Miller is the Apollo Program Professor of Aeronautics at MIT and former NASA Deputy Administrator. She also serves on Aerospace's Board of Trustees. Dr. Anne Karagosian is the director of the Joint UCLA Air Force Research Laboratory Collaborative Center for Aerospace Sciences and distinguished professor at UCLA's Samuli School of Engineering. Dr. Karagosian was the first woman to join the faculty at UCLA's Department of Mechanical Engineering and Aerospace. Dr. Bobby Braun is director for planetary science at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's been Dean of Engineering and Applied Science at the University of Colorado Boulder and faculty at Georgia Institute of Technology. Welcome and over to Dave to get us started. Well, thank you, Rebecca. I wanna welcome you to Aerospace Corporation's Space Policy Show. This episode will explore how national labs and FFRDCs partner with universities to advance research for the US Space Enterprise. With us today, we're fortunate to have experts whose experiences span academia, FFRDCs, national labs, government, and international partnerships. These experiences also span policy, science and technology, as well as education innovation. So this leaves them a unique and important perspective on today's topic. So first, let me introduce our panelists. Anne, thanks for joining us today. David, it's great to see you here. And Bobby, it's great to see you again. So let's start right off the bat with some tough questions. And Bobby, we'll start with you. So the first question I wanna ask you, and, and we'll go around in a rotation here after Bobby's done, how can academia play critical path roles in FFRDC and national lab programs? Uh, well, first of all, Dave, thank you for including me in this event. And it's great to see my colleagues here with me. Um, it's great to be with you all. Uh, it's, it's a great question. And I would start the answer by just saying, Universities are already engaged with FFRDCs in critical path activities. Uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where I work now, uh, is NASA's only FFRDC, and we would not be successful without, uh, frankly, dozens of partnerships uh, in the university sector. Every one of our planetary science missions uh, involves uh, science investigators, sometimes instrument providers, uh, sometimes technologists uh, at a number of typically American uh, universities. Um, just as an example, uh, the Psyche mission that we're working on right now, which will launch in 2022 uh, and, and orbit and observe uh, a very interesting asteroid, uh, is led by a principal investigator at Arizona State University. Uh, the Mars 2020 rover, uh, Perseverance, which landed, has several investigators actually from that same university uh, and other universities across the country uh, involved. Uh, in our technology space, uh, we're very interested in partnering with universities in advanced technologies, uh, whether it's you know optical uh, technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, 3D printing and on-orbit manufacturing. Uh, these are all areas where the universities, because of the basic research focus that they have, tend to be a little bit ahead of the FFRDCs, um, and partnerships uh, allow those technologies to go to mission infusion. And that's, uh, frankly, that's good for the whole country. 
Great. Thanks, Bobby. Anne, do you want to follow up with that? Or? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so one thing that is very important for us to recognize as universities, I believe, is that our major product is our students. And so in terms of playing a critical path role for the national laboratories or for the FFRDCs, it is the problem solving capabilities that students learn, not only in the classroom, but in doing research, as well as the fundamental research capabilities that are developed in them for uh, the technologies that underlie so many important uh, national security and other uh, space related um, capabilities that our country has. Um, one of many examples that I could cite is actually a collaboration that we have at UCLA with the Air Force Research Lab located at Edwards Air Force Base, the uh, AFRL RQR uh, group, which um, focuses on rocket propulsion systems, both chemical and electric propulsion systems. And that kind of um, collaboration where students and others are able to go to the National Laboratory and do research, um, as long as it is fundamental, it becomes part of their PhD dissertation or uh, even summer internships for undergrads. There's just so many uh, areas in which universities play a critical path, um, especially with respect to the seed corn and, as I say, the product that we have, which is our students. Great. Thanks, Anne. Uh, David, you, those, that, that's a hard act to follow. Do you have anything you'd like to add to this topic? Thanks, Dave. And thanks again for inviting us. And what a what a wonderful sure. panel. So great to, to see you, Anne and, and Bobby and Dave. Really glad to be with you today. I'd like to give uh, three examples that um, add, I think, to what's been said. You know, again, academia playing the critical role. We want to play as large a role as we possibly can. As Anne said, with the, it's such an opportunity for our students and faculty. Uh, it challenges us. This partnership is critically important. It's just a just a win-win. So, three examples are in terms of with Aerospace Corporation, the opportunity. We do a lot of CubeSat work at, at MIT and and across all of our universities. But what an opportunity to partner with Aerospace to really realize that mission to fly. You know the state of the art um, technology that we've been developing. But that giving the students and faculty the real mission opportunities and accelerating that. That's one example of, you know, wonderful partnership we have with Aerospace Corp. A second, of course, with JPL at MIT. Uh, Bobby left it for me to say, we have MOXIE. So we are on Mars 2020, you know, Perseverance Rover. But guess who's making oxygen on Mars? I mean, this is bold. This is a demonstration for in-situ resource, resource utilization, you know, ISRU. And we are thrilled. So, you know, all day, all night on all those shifts. You know, our team is, is on Mars time, on Sol. So to realize uh, that partnership, it's just, it's really the pinnacle, I think, of any student or faculty, you know, academic career to participate with the FFRDCs on these major missions. So that's kind of critical path. And then my third example would be with the uh, MIT Lincoln Labs. That's FFRDC as well. And so right now I'm leading a large effort in artificial intelligence for weather and climate. Now, we can do that research at MIT. It's, it's incredible research in machine learning, physics-informed neural nets, and some GANs, generative you know, adversarial networks. But what I love about it, and to emphasize the critical path in the partnership, is it's not just MIT research. With Lincoln Labs and funded by the U.S. Air Force, we, our mandate is to make it operational. And that's the push we need, I think, in academia. We have to take our research, all those algorithms. We have really important challenges. In this case, weather. Uh, so it's, you know, called near time. It's not forecasting. It's really trying to do this in real time. Problem. We love problems. Working with our the FFRDC, MIT Lincoln Labs, they have such great operational experience. And then the Air Force, in this sense, are the customers. And so the airmen are embedded with us right in academia. So that's just been a great partnership and we hope will be really impactful. Great, Dave. Uh, thanks. I definitely have a good set of uh, panel members here today. So let me ask you a related question. The uh, Senate recently approved the Innovation and Competition Act. It sets goals for strengthening U.S. leadership in the areas of artificial intelligence, high-performance computing, 
uh, additive manufacturing and the commercialization of those, among other things. So in my question to you is, and Anne, I want to start with you on this one. In what ways can partnerships between academia and FFRDCs and, or national labs further the goals that are stated in that document? Well, I think there are numerous ways, Dave. You know, the Act does create this Directorate of Technology and Innovation at NSF, at the National Science Foundation, and there are components of the Act that address uh, the space arena through NASA. Um, so I think there are numerous opportunities and partnerships that could be created. As I said, the universities are the engines for development of technologies, primarily through their students, but also through the uh, fundamentals, the so-called 6-1 based research that is uh, key to the future of such technologies. Um, there are many ways in which this could be fostered, you know, possibly an example that is not as easy to replicate are uh, partnerships that exist sort of um, it quite naturally because of geographic location. So the University of California, for example, has oversight responsibilities for some of the DOE and NNSA uh, national laboratories that are um, relatively adjacent to us. So Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Los Alamos, and the partnerships there, even though there is a, a good deal of uh, classified and highly classified um, research and applied research going on at, at these laboratories, there also are fundamental uh, programs ongoing, and there actually is a requirement that the funding that the University of California receives for this oversight must be plugged into the research arena. So we have research competitions within our university system for interdisciplinary partnerships that can come about with between the university uh, campuses, not just UCLA, but Berkeley, Santa Cruz and so forth, and the um, national labs. So that's just one example. That sort of thing could potentially be replicated for uh, FFRDCs. I know they exist um, for parts of JPL, for example, and the funding opportunities that are made available to universities. So I see a great deal of potential in um, this act. Great, and can I just ask you a follow-up piece? I think there's a part of this that is trying to pull technology away, from, you know, pull technology development and innovation, expand it beyond the traditional locations, you know, and um, they're talking about these uh, regional technology strategies. Could you maybe address how we can make sure that that kind of happens away from, you know, in addition to the, the typical investments we have in certain technology hubs? Well, I think you'd, you'd need to look to see where the strengths lie, where the innovation is currently taking place, where that regional uh, enterprise could be expanded to the universities that are local or maybe not even that far away. Uh, I think there, there are ways that that can be expanded, but it must be done carefully. And I know that at some point we'll probably get into a discussion on ITAR and so forth. But I yes. think the, the potential is there. I mean, the basic, the fundamental research capabilities exist at universities. And I think they are very ready for such partnerships to push forward right. the innovation and as you mentioned, to sort of pull out uh, the co contributions that could be made in the development of these um, technologies. Great, thanks, Ann. Deva, would you like to add to Ann's comments? Thank you. Sure, I think most importantly, uh, the name and the Senate <laughs> Uh, approving this. This is really important. So let's start at that level. The Innovation and Competition Act. That sends a great message. This is all for science and technology. So that's really important saying, okay, we're going to, um, you know, really <laughs> hopefully raise budgets in science and te technology. We're going to be focused on innovation and we're going to compete, you know, through innovation. So just even the name and, and going forward with this act, I think is a great step. It actually 
in my opinion, it really follows on the America's Competes Act. Uh, that was great legislation. And we know we get the appropriations, we get the budget from Congress for our federal agencies. That's really important. And then this is a big ask. This goes across multiple agencies with the Department of Housing involved, with the special centers and mentioned in NSF. It includes the NATHA authorization wording. So it's great work. We know the folks of us have been in government. It's hard to work across all the agencies. So we need this legislation. Again, first and foremost, say, what can we do, you know, innovation? How do we make sure everyone's at the table? That's what it says to me, that they get the table, universities, and just a comment on the regional innovation hubs. I love that being in there. I think that's the strength that the universities bring to the table. We do work in our communities. We we can have our pulse on our regional economies and the science and technology across, you know, all universities. I'm in the Boston area, of course, at MIT. And so when you say, well, regional for New England, the area that folks I'd say in New England, we, that's what we study. You know, we study it from the social science. We study it from the technology and what are the gaps? So I think then teaming with the federal agencies and with the FFRDCs, hopefully kind of right in the middle, the national action, state of the art FFRDC work. So I kind of see it at those three, the academic environment, really having expertise and kind of regional strategy for innovation, where the gaps are, the gaps are different across the whole nation. And so maybe we can focus and specialize and, and again, at the end of the day, realize a significant change and focus in, in innovation because we need to compete. <laughs> we need to innovate or else we're going out of business. So that's what I love about it is this gives us the framework and it brings all the players to the table. Hey, thanks, Deva. Hey, Bobby, you've had a breather. Would you like to chime in on this one or? Yeah, I could just add a couple points. Um, I, I agree with my colleagues. Um, the act is uh, incredibly important and I think it's a great step forward uh, for our nation. Um, I'm very excited about it. If you read through the details of the act, uh, it talks about both areas where our nation needs to make critical investments. Um, and I frankly, I agree uh, with those investments. But it also talks about infusing those basic research ideas into practice so that they impact our society, our economy, our way of life, uh, including, frankly, uh, our space environment and our space applications. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you think about that, that's really the role that FFRDCs can play. Uh, an FFRDC like JPL or others at, at DOE or around our, our country uh, are both attuned to government needs um, and have a foot in academia. So at JPL, we're part NASA, part Caltech, for instance. And so we're pretty able, I think, to understand the culture and the environments uh, at universities in terms of partnering. And I think it's frankly on the FFRDCs in our nation uh, as a result of this act to step up and to do more partnering uh, with universities, to take some of these basic research areas and bring them in and translate them into products uh, that are gonna benefit our society. Uh, in terms of the regional aspect of the act, I just would add, you know, there are innovators all around the country. Um, there are innovators everywhere. Uh, and certainly at a wealth of universities uh, that we have, uh, such a diverse set of universities in our country with such a diverse range of innovators. And I think it's on all of us, um, certainly the FFRDCs, to do a better job of reaching out to maybe non-traditional universities uh, that we maybe don't are that aren't already in our backyard that we haven't partnered with for 20 or 50 years um, and uh, engage those innovators wherever they may be. Yeah, thanks, Bobby. You know, if we're looking for just really distributing part of this innovation, uh, you know, the universities really are highly distributed across the country, and that's an important point and a good a good mechanism for for uh, distributing that. Uh, this innovation and research. So thanks, Bobby. Hey, Deva, uh, I was gonna lead with you uh, on this next question, and it's a little more like looking under the hood of research. I wanted to see if uh, you had any thoughts on what are kind of the emerging science and technology needs in the government that academia should know about or vice versa. What are what are the things that are incubating in, in academia that maybe the government doesn't even know about yet that 
but should pay attention to. Over. Thanks, Dave. I, I love this question. Yeah, kind of merging, merging science and technology needs in, in government. Um, pretty exciting. Uh, going from government back to back to academia now. Uh, so I think people uh, realize uh, cybersecurity. I'd put I'd put right up there. I we think we're going to move into talking about national security strategy as well. The AI AI means everything, right? It's all encompassing. But really now the implementation and uh, like machine learning. We talk about the advanced aspects of of AI, and we really I think need to to focus. We're doing this in research. What's been a missed opportunity, in my opinion, the last decade when it comes to the great AI work. This is universities, but this is in industry as well. But we've missed the opportunity to really put um, equity and society, and make sure that we have our technology and our computer scientists and technologists and engineers and with our social sciences, with our humanists, are we getting this right? Can't just be serving up this technology that is not accounting for the societal implications. So that's a two-way street. I think government needs it. I think academia needs it. And we're just starting, I think, to have the, the serious and hard discussions uh, about that. So that's emerging science and technology, but it's a, it's a more holistic. I think we need to take a more holistic, you know, deep dive into that area. And my specific example is, you know, artificial intelligence, but of course we can map it to other areas and autonomy. So we're, we're all in these, uh, you know, we're in the, the next 10 years of, you know, the future. And I think also another area that, you know, humans, machines, systems, how do we get that right? It's also not just autonomy and autonomous systems to me. And I have to point to, to Mars and, uh, you know, we're on Mars and we're <laughs> running this mission, you know, very autonomously. But the people, the people are at all the universities and guess what? And JPL is, you know, mission control and all the people. And so that's just a great example that that's here to stay. And we'd love to test out these systems, develop some state of the art in universities. And then again, work with our FFRDCs that feel them. So these are these are areas I think we're spending some more time again. Just a recap: you know, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and then let's I put it under kind of human robotic interaction would be my my third area right now. Um, but uh, that's just that's just tip of the iceberg. You know, materials, <laughs> biological, and digital. All these areas are just um, moving almost almost at the speed of uh, real real life in real time. You know, that's just so exciting. And to flip it to the pandemic. And uh, end my remarks on thinking about COVID and the vaccines. This mRNA vaccine, it's, it's really 20 years in the making. And so, again, asking about you know what the, the, the gaps are rather than seeing kind of the gaps of the emerging, what's emerging in academia, but also in government. And one thing I was thinking of for the first question is, what about exchange of people? Because at the end of the day, of course, we get enamored with our technology, but um, I just love the model where we have, you know, IPA going from universities to uh, if it is to the agencies and back and forth. And how about the government folks and industry folks coming and visit, visiting and spending time in academia with us? I think I think that's the best way to share ideas and talk about what's emerging is, you know, that that real being together and can't wait till we're all together really in our labs and back in person. <laughs> hey, David, can I ask you a follow up question? The, uh, sure. You know, with the COVID pandemic, you know, everyone had to sort of turn on a dime in order to go telework and all that. And, and the universities had to do that with their teaching. Now that, um, you know, a lot of that, we understand how to do that better, to do the virtual classroom and things like that. Do you think that has implications for how we could do better collaboration with government and FFRDCs on their continuous learning, you know, their, on, their, their career learning as they're going through? It's, it might provide a maybe a better interface to really sort of amp up uh, mid-career learning. Do you have any thoughts on that? I hope so. And we're, we're studying it. So it's really a research area. Now, it, it had been a research area for all of us. I think, you know, lots of folks in academia is put it in you know, education and learning. But now it's a hybrid model. And there were a lot of naysayers. Oh, we can't possibly put everything online. We can't. So we had a lot of excuses. And then overnight, we put everything online. So uh, nothing right. like urgency. Now we did it, but it, we did it so quickly in terms of the virtual offerings that I think now the opportunity is we need to really study it. Now we need to 
do the research in terms of what's the best hybrid model for in-person and then online learning going forward. That's what we don't know. That's why it's really is that's the emerging s &T needs, I think, for government, you know, industry and academia. So we're on it as kind of a major research learning, if you will, focus in, in academia, that hybrid model is frankly, I I don't know. I know I do some things better online. It's very efficient. Uh, I sure would love to be with the three of you in person for this recording. I, that would be much more pleasurable. And we have to figure that out. What's the high value added? You know, what do we need to be in person for? And I think that's kind of creativity. It goes back to innovation, the brainstorming, getting things done. It's kind of hard to do, you know, mechanical, electrical systems virtually. At least I find it hard, you know, in the designing and building. But then if we can, back to your point, Dave, about offering training, offering knowledge you know that should all be free and that should be open and online and that's great for training and say training career folks in ffrdc and it, it gives us these really wonderful models about it's not the academic 14 week model it's it's asynchronous it's you know when people have time and putting things online so that folks can access it and you know some new basically it's kind of work of the future what's that going to look like so it gets into that whole area as well and trying to uh, get that hybrid learning and education model um, going forward hey thanks deva uh, bobby do you have any insights on uh if you could uh, steer what academia is working on that would help uh the government agencies do you have any thoughts there well let me start out by saying i think david's list was spot on um <clears throat> all of those things uh would affect our space program and, and jpl's missions uh significantly the one area that i would you know add to the conversation uh, I really believe that there's going to be a, a major uh, economic um, and societal breakthrough in, in space robotics and manufacturing in near Earth space. Um, you know, not I'm not talking about factories on Mars quite yet, um, but around the Earth, uh, towards the moon, um, you know, in that space, I think uh, just the advancements that we've seen in robotics and autonomy. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, you know, the miniaturization uh, that's been happening in our space program. If you kind of couple all of those trends together, what you can see is uh, in the next 10 or maybe even 20 years, you know, uh, factories that are building things in space um, that we frankly can't build um, in the same way on the earth. Um, so I, I think that's something that's very much coming and would be a benefit for a number of reasons to our country and society. Great. So, so Bobby, you're saying that the future of space is not kind of that stoic past of, you know, put things in place and and try not to touch them too much, but now it's going to be a very active uh, ecosystem with a lot of the oh, kinds of uh, infrastructure that we enjoy today on the ground. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so. And also, if you just look, I mean, the other big change in space is the commercial interest, right? It's yeah. no longer just the provenance of nation states. Um, we have companies, uh, industry making su significant investment um, in the future of society in space. Uh, I think robotics will lead the way uh, for a number of reasons, um, miniaturization, cost, capability. Uh, autonomy being the reasons, uh, those reasons. Um, and I imagine that, you know, and we're on that path. No. Hey, thanks, Bobby. Anne, would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, I think there, you know, all of the technology areas that have been mentioned are extremely important. Um, there are two more I'd like to add. One is rather narrow, and that pertains to uh, the arena of hypersonics, hypersonic flight capabilities in terms of experimentation and simulation. Um, and there are areas, you know, like that, including uh, cybersecurity, where some of our nation's experts do reside in universities. Um, and yet there may be restrictions on access to such information and pushing the envelope that could become uh, challenging and problematic, shall we say. The other area I'd like to highlight are um, tools, machine learning, data science-based tools, dynamical systems, kinds of 
tools that can be complete game changers in so many areas of technology, as well as non-technological areas, uh, population data, for example. You know, so there are many areas where universities are leading the way, and I see actually a bit of a lag in in industry and to an extent, a lesser extent in national laboratories and FFRDCs. But I think there are many areas where partnerships make a great deal of sense in these areas. Thank, thanks, Anne. I, I'd like to, I, I just wanted to focus that question on me as well. I wanted to answer one topic that I'm pretty interested in, and it's, it's called design under uncertainty. And I know that sounds pretty cryptic, but, but it's something we do every day, you know, whether it's what we buy or where we choose to live or what careers we're following. We don't know the future. Um, but when we do engineering work, you know, we tend to design for very sharp, well-defined requirements. You know, this is the mission. Let's build the best thing to meet the needs of that mission. We, I think there's a, there's a benefit and an opportunity here if we can start thinking about how we design systems um, and space systems would be the same under, you know, in, with, recognizing that we don't know the future. So we have to be able to build, you know, robustness into it so it can accommodate uncertainty. We have to build uh, adaptability into them so that as, as we put them out there, deploy them in space, maybe the mission has changed and they have new requirements that we did not foresee. How do we do design, engineering design in that new kind of way? So I'll, um, I'll move on to the next question, and Anne, it really ties into the one that you just brought up. So <laughs> here you go. Uh, how do we navigate ITAR, EAR, and the need for academia to publish openly as part of their, you know, the theses they produce and so forth? And a sort of a companion question to that is, how do we engage international students in what we do here in the United States? And, you know, I think space is the space arena is often a more challenging arena there to engage them. Do you have thoughts along that line? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, based on experience, actually, because for a while I was UCLA's interim vice chancellor for research for the entire research enterprise. So, so I'm familiar with many of the restrictions you mentioned. So most um, R1 universities, you know, first-rate research universities in this country operate under the fundamental research exclusion principle. So that formally uh, prohibits uh, ITAR, EAR-controlled data. Those are not supposed to be included in the research that's being performed. Um, the publication review issue is actually not always as big a deal because most universities have collaborations with industry where there is a requirement for publication review before dissemination. And so most university systems like, like mine can accommodate that, but it's the um, specific access to uh, controlled materials that um, gives, gives such university systems heartburn. Um, and as well, you know, requirements, strict requirements pertaining to who can work on such research if it's based at the university. But as I mentioned, um, when aspects of basic research can be conducted by university students and other researchers at a national laboratory or at even an FFRDC, where you need to be a U.S. citizen to get there, even though the research is basic, that often can be accommodated by universities. Um, but violating this fundamental research exclusion principle, I think, you know, some universities have off-site facilities where they can they can perform ITAR, but uh, research based research, although again. A, a PhD dissertation has to be openly publishable. So even um, performing that kind of activity is challenging to accommodate. And believe me, a university that has over a billion dollars in research, in their research portfolio per year, isn't going to 
you know, violate that fundamental research exclusion just right. for maybe a promise of a few million dollars in research. Um, with respect, but it is doable, as I say, but you have to operate carefully. With respect to international students, you know, many of the top scientists and engineers in our country who work in the national security space were born outside of this country and they became naturalized citizens after graduate school very frequently. That is still something that is possible, but it takes time. And this is where I believe the national labs in particular can pay, play a key role. There are a number of uh, DOE and even NNSA labs, um, not as much DOD labs, but where a, student, a person who's graduated with a PhD can go and work as a postdoc. They work um, under a, um, what do they call it, a, a practical training capability within their F-1 visa. And the national labs, this is outside the fence, of course, so they work on unclassified programs. They know how to transition very smoothly from that type of visa to the H-1B and eventually to apply for a green card and eventually to gain citizenship. And this is to me such a crucial role that the national laboratories perform for our country in moving the best and the brightest who are educated here, who have wonderful technical capabilities to be able to become citizens and serve in uh, very important roles. So it would be great if other national laboratories, DOD-based labs in particular, were to have that capability. I know the Army Research Lab has a program that is designed to, um, to move in that kind of direction, but I think there are ways that we can work, but right now um, there are challenges for sure. Thanks, Anne. David, do you wanna take a stab at this uh, topic? Sure, just to, I think, add on, hopefully, and compliment what Anne was saying. It was great uh, groundwork. But I think we need a magnitude of order increase. So we have some great models. So the national labs um, providing that um, practical training, you know, with the, with our international students. There's also a, there's a, a major, um, there's major challenges with ITAR, and there's also a perception problem. So maybe I just break that down a little bit. So for, we are, you know, a mixing pot. We're the soup of great uh, internationals. And said, you look around the table of almost any tech company, almost any government agent when we're, agency, when we're talking science and technology, m many times more than 50% of the folks are, are international, foreign born. That be, And so we have to make that path extremely easy, much easier. Right now, it is incredibly difficult. So why don't we have, and again, my, my goal would be, you know, order of magnitude, more opportunities for our international PhDs, you know, graduated PhD, international folks. They, they love the U.S. They've been trained here. They're colleagues. And um, we just need to treat them better in my mind. So many more opportunities. They find it so hard. The fears and persistence and sometimes it's economic trying to stay in the U.S., just trying to get that job, just trying to get, you know, that job. Thank goodness for some of the FFRDCs. I'll name, you know, JPL. It's amazing because it's affiliated with Caltech. So guess what? We can send our best and brightest. And best and brightest are U.S. as well as international folks. And to the perception, students talk. Um, students literally, you know, boycott. And, you know, I'm so proud of them. I'm actually, they're saying, you have got to change the rules, U.S. We want to stay here. You know, we've given you our all. Please give us an opportunity. And they really feel um, they really feel the constraints. They feel barred. Now, some of them make it. But I say right now we're making it extremely difficult. So why don't we all, you know, team up? Can we change that? Can we have an order of magnitude more opportunities? internships, including, you know, all of us and technologists, and there's proper vetting, and people can go through the paces. Now, it takes years and a lot of money, and that's that's just wrong, in my opinion. So, I think of it so much as navigating ITAR. Of course, ITAR and clearances and security is of the utmost importance, but surely we can keep that in place as well as we can do it once. You know, we can keep that in place. And when it comes to space systems, let's look at the systems that should not be ITAR classified. So for changing ITAR, and I think universities have a major role to play 
and leadership and moving this forward. Because surely all space systems shouldn't be classed. Some of the ones that you know, I work on, <laughs> space you know, human mobility and skeletons, you know, those should not be classified in my opinion. I'm trying to help people, you know, on the earth as well as maybe on Mars. So let's say, let's, uh, you know, revisit ITAR. Let's, uh, I can uh, have some later. I think it's time to, to reboot, frankly, ITAR and let's send the message, but we have to have real action behind our messaging to all of our international community, students, faculty, colleagues, or us, you know, look in the mirror. This, this is us. We need everyone. If we go back to the question on innovation and be the absolute best in science and technology, we need everyone. So thanks for the question. Um, it's definitely a, a prickly one, but uh, I'm ready to act, you know, and let's have leadership and um, not just, um, you know, be, be frustrated. And again, to the students, they need to know that um, that they're welcome, that they have a place. And, and um, you know, I just want to, I just love to see an opportunity for all of them to stay in the U.S. and, and work with us. Uh, I'll just very quickly add that, uh, you know, before I was at JPL, I was a, a faculty member at both Georgia Tech and the University of Colorado Boulder. And at both of those universities, I ran a research group uh, that was focused on atmospheric entry uh, at Mars. Um, and uh, some of that work was designated ITAR uh, restricted. Both of those universities um, have uh, accommodations, uh, you know, facilities and other ways to deal with ITAR restricted work. Uh, it is a real challenge, though, uh, for any faculty member um, that is managing that kind of work uh, at a university. Uh, it creates kind of a, a haves and a haves not uh, culture uh, in the research lab, uh, sometimes between your U.S. students and your foreign uh, or international students, uh, particularly when it comes to summer internships and, and things like that um, at various institutions, uh, you know, NASA or, or even in industry. Um, and, I, and if I think and look at JPL, and I, I take a look at our leadership team, it's quite striking uh, the number of JPL leaders who were first in their family to come to this country, get educated, uh, and then stay for employment. And if you think about our space program uh, and what our space program, the US space program has accomplished historically, um, you know, international contributions uh, by, you know, the international community that has come to America to live and contribute to our space program is phenomenal. And uh, we would be nowhere near where we are without those contributions. And so uh, we do have to tackle this problem head on um, uh, because I, I, like the others on the panel, I do fear that we are losing some of the best talent um, and people who very much could contribute to our space program's future. Uh, in this country. Great, thanks, Bobby. Uh, we're getting near the end here. What I'd like to do is just go around the panel for some closing thoughts. Maybe there's a some comments you wanted to make, but you didn't really find the place to make it. Now's going to be your chance. And uh, Deva, let's start with you. Okay, thanks. What a pleasure to be with everyone again. I think it's in closing and just some final comments. I'm reminiscing about the students of the future. That's that's uh, that's who I work for. Is the next generation of leadership in space, open government, industry, and um, it's an incredibly exciting time. So just think about space. We touched on it, but the amazing possibilities also in commercial space. We're just 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 uh, it's just hard to to think about. We're planning a lot of this uh, 20 years ago. You know, not 30, and it's real as. Uh, we're going to be sending many more people, you know, normal people, let's say, into into space. I say that's the dream come true for me, since I specialize in human space flight. And so, providing those opportunities, I really do think that now, from a CubeSat to a human space flight mission, the opportunity for everyone is there. And the challenge is pertinent, you know, to say, is it how do we all partner? How do we all work together a little bit better? I think it'll take time, but we start for sure with opportunities internships, uh, as I said previously, you know, mix of people. Let's get our students and the experts and the, the wise older people who have all experience. Let's get everyone around the table 
and just open it up. If we can get a few of these restrictions that we have in and, and both ways, and welcome, you know, opportunity, is a shout out and please folks in industry, you know, come visit us in academia and government. Again, this exchange of people and personnel, because we all know that for in our own environment, we can kind of give up some of our magic, some of our magic and innovation, let's say, and then say, you know, I don't have the, the answer for, for NASA or government, but come spend some time with us, see how we do it. Let's all talk about best practices. And then surely folks are going to go back to their FFRDC, their age agency. And I think we only do that, again, the really diverse, mixed team. Can't all stay in our comfort zone. You know, we can't all stay in university or, you know, industry or government. And the opportunity is just here. It's uh, it's incredibly exciting. We brought some challenges of ITAR in terms of um, security. We talked a little bit about so those. Those are the challenges in terms of the technologies. But on the the optimistic side is just we are in a decade, this coming decade, where it is a democratization of space, you know, full stop. So from CubeSats to humans to uh, proliferation, Bobby mentioned this amazing uh, manufacturing capabilities. That's like visionary. That's futuristic. But we're here, you know, so <laughs> we're here in the in the future. And also my, my last point would be also really good thinking on terms of uh, terms of the national security aspects of it again this is really where the FFRDCs I believe are leading and so that's where the leadership from FFRDCs um, pulling government along with them they are government funded but then inviting academia invite us to work with you because that important important work in space situational situation awareness um, space security cybersecurity, all the way down to ground ops and stations I think uh, like that as the, you know, let's write. And I think that's a and pretty urgent need as well. Thanks, Dave. Hey, Bobby, any last comment? Uh, yeah, I have one thing I'd like to add um, that we haven't touched on yet. Um, first of all, Dave, I just, to you, I want to say thank you again for including me uh, among this August group and, and for uh, being part of this panel. It's been fun. Um, uh, JPL uh, has one of the largest uh, summer internship programs, I think, in the country. Um, and that program uh, was, of course, impacted this past year by the pandemic, like like everything was. Uh, but that program is opening up again, and we're very excited about it. Um, the reason I'm mentioning it is uh, it's a summer uh, research fellowship program. It's open to students from universities across the country. Um, really, the whole broad set of universities. There are on the order, in a typical year, there are on the order of about a thousand uh, summer students that come out to JPL. And uh, frankly, that's an incredibly important, uh, it's a service that we provide in terms of engaging with universities, but it's also an incredibly important source of future talent uh, for JPL. And many, many of our current employees you know, got their start through uh, a summer research fellowship. Uh, the program is administered uh, in conjunction with Caltech, uh, which is how we're able to reach out uh, the way we do. Um, and so it's kind of a joint, uh, in a sense, campus uh, JPL program. Um, and it's been uh, remarkably successful. Uh, when I look at the challenges ahead of us uh, in planetary science, in astrophysics, in earth science, you know, the next decade or so at JPL is full of undertakings and challenges that are just really significant uh, and exciting. Uh, the science that we're going after is you know, fundamental. Uh, questions like, you know, are we alone? Um, is there another Earth um, out there somewhere? You know, th these kinds of questions and um, the instrumentation and the, the engineering prowess that's going to be needed to address those questions is going to take all of us, not just the folks that are at JPL today, but our partners in the university sector, uh, and certainly the students uh, that we hope to bring to JPL through these programs, um, and perhaps even hire one day. Uh, thank you again for including me in this program. It's been really fun. Thanks, Bobby. And Anne, I've uh, given you the last word. Wow, thank you. And, and I'd like to You're offer welcome. my thanks as well. This has been um, a very interesting discussion. I'm so glad we've touched upon so many of these important topics. So I just want to reinforce that the time is now 
to enhance partnerships between universities and the national security slash space policy uh, arena. Um, these include partnerships with um, national laboratories, some of which have a very robust kind of uh, enterprise in terms of collaborating with universities. Others are more restrictive. One can learn from the other for sure. Uh, and in addition with FFRDCs, JPL is a terrific model for that. Many others have not really jumped on board yet with that kind of robust partnership with universities and enhancing opportunities for students to have uh, internships, but also to fund research opportunities at universities. So once again, you know, the universities provide two essential ingredients to um, the scientific and engineering enterprise, the technology enterprise for this country. It's our major product, which is our students, as well as the research and development that goes on in our laboratories. So these are truly key um, capabilities that universities have that truly need to be uh, exploited more, I would say, and dealt with in a more appropriate manner, as, as we've indicated. Having uh, robust pathways for international students to uh, move into and contribute to this country after their graduation. Robust programs where our US citizens, who are our students, have the capability and, and um, are given programs and projects to work on that could lead eventually to these contributions at the national scale. There are so many uh, good examples and maybe not so good examples out there that we really need to learn from. So I'm very happy once again to have participated in this discussion and look forward to um, improvements and enhancements in our national dialogue on this very important subject. Thanks, Anne, and thanks to the whole panel. I think it's been a great discussion and, uh, and on some very uh, urgent and important topics. So I really appreciate you volunteering to uh, take time out of your day to, to talk with me and our audience. And, uh, you know, thank you again. And uh, Rebecca, over to you. Thank you to Dave and our guests for that discussion, and thanks to our amazing production team, Colleen Stover, James Liggins, and Jordan Bingham. Check us out on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show, and sign up for our latest news and alerts at aerospace.org policy. Be sure to look for our podcasts and share your favorite episodes with colleagues. Stay tuned for more to come on the Space Policy Show. Next week, we talk about Space Force design and lessons learned from the Marine Corps. And until then, take care. <laughs>